Hi everybody if you're a UPSC law or an economic student this is one of the most important case studies you will ever study we all know what happened to kingfisher airlines right and if you remember these kind of defaults and thousands of crores in losses were not a new thing in india at all in a big win for indian banks a london high court has declared bijay malia bankrupt are you going to return to india and do you think you can reach a settlement with the banks i am interested in a settlement with the kingfisher airline bankers I have That's never it. been able to understand where this 9000 crore or 900 million figure came from authorities have intensified the hunt for billionaire diamond jeweler nirav modi who's missing after an 11400 crore bank fraud was unearthed another airline is strapped for cash go first has decided to file for bankruptcy but do you realize Even GoFast in India was and still is struggling but somehow bankruptcy turned out to be a good thing for them and they are still in business the question is how is this even possible similarly in our previous episode we saw how india was facing a banking crisis in 2017 and 2018 because our banks were having thousands of crores in bad debt so india was in such a critical situation that while on one hand our banks had thousands of crores in bad debt we also had giant companies that were failing in such a way that the employees lost their jobs creditors lost their money and the shareholders lost their share value this is the reason why in 2016 our former finance minister arun jaitley made an iconic announcement where he announced something called the insolvency and bankruptcy code the union cabinet has amended the insolvency and bankruptcy code via the ordinance route it came at a time when the indian banking sector was struggling with an npa crisis the government dues could be low in the waterfall because whatever you give to the government you take from the banks and this one code alone has been so revolutionary for india that it has saved 3.16 lakh crores for our banks it has saved lakhs of job losses and most importantly today it has become one of the most important pillars of the indian economy and this is something that sanjeev sanyal speaks about very very often this is the reason why if you are an economic student a law student or a upsc student this indian bankruptcy code is by far one of the most important policies you will ever study so in this episode of the economic series let's do a deep dive and try to understand what were the problems that were haunting the indian banking system what is this indian bankruptcy code why is it considered to be one of the most revolutionary economic policies in indian history and most importantly how has it benefited ordinary people like you and me But before we move on I want to thank Odoo for sponsoring our content. Odoo is an enterprise resource planning software that covers all the company requirements such as CRM, website, e-commerce, accounting, invoicing, inventory and point of sale. It is the only platform you will ever need to run your entire business operations. For example, let's consider their new tool invoicing. Instead of you keeping track of all the payments and finances, Odoo simplifies the process by helping you keep track of your finances and manage your invoicing process automatically. First, you set it up with your company data, choose an invoice design, create your first invoice by adding the client details, the products and service charges if needed. And then you add the bank data to enable online payments. You can also configure the payment terms to make it suitable for both parties. Once this is done, Odoo sends the invoices via email and tracks the outstanding payments with the status and due dates. You will see all the activities against the invoices and the current status which automatically changes once the payment is done. This is how detailed and automatic your process gets. And guess what? Amongst the multiple applications that Odoo offers, the first one you use is completely free for life with unlimited hosting and support. So if you find this useful, check out Odoo from the link in the description for an all-in-one business management software that can transform your business operations. Chalo, let's start from the basics and understand why do companies declare bankruptcy in the first place? In simple words, if a company is unable to pay its vendors, banks and employees or if it has more liabilities than assets, then companies usually declare bankruptcy. But before 2016's IBC, there were many laws and mechanisms that were governing the companies. In total, there were seven acts as you can see in this chart. And because of these acts, the system was extremely messy. Now you might assume that I'm going to give you all the details of these boring acts, but don't worry at all. All you need to understand is a simple story and you will understand the entire system that was in place before 2016. So let's understand the complexities of the system using a simple story. Let's say you live in a large housing society with many apartments 
common areas and facilities. This society is governed by multiple committees and each committee is responsible for different aspects of the society. So the garden committee is responsible for the gardens and the play area. The maintenance committee is responsible for making the building look neat and clean and the security committee is responsible for the safety of the citizens. And each committee is equally powerful as the other. So the security committee cannot overrule the garden committee just because they have a stupid name. But now there is a critical problem in the society. As it turns out, there is a major water leak that is extremely dangerous for the structure of the building. So if this water leak is not fixed, the building itself might collapse. Now as soon as this announcement is done, the garden committee is worried about the water coming into the gardens. So they divert the water towards other areas of the society which then seeps into the foundation of the building which is making the building even more weaker. The maintenance committee does not have the engineering expertise so all they do is they apply POP to all the cracks in the building so that the building looks neat and clean which is their job. And the security committee is extremely worried about the safety of the citizens so what they do is they evacuate everyone from the building immediately saying that the building is going to collapse. So ultimately while all these committees were engaged in doing the right thing according to their job description, nobody is actually fixing the actual problem which is the water leak in the building. And since all these committees are equally powerful, the garden committee cannot command the maintenance committee to go and fix the leak. Similarly, the security committee cannot stop the garden committee from diverting the water. So eventually what happens? The building collapses. And instead of spending a few lakhs into fixing the water leak, because of this lack of direction and chaos, the residents faced crores in losses and they lost their houses. So if you see this system from a macro standpoint, what does this system look like? It is a multi-department system where the departments act on their respective problem individually but do not solve the root cause of the problem, right? Well, this is exactly how our bankruptcy system functioned before 2016 whereby just like the garden committee, maintenance committee and the security committee, we had the civil court, the debt recovery tribunal and the company law board. So the customers and the employees would go to the civil court, the investors would go to the company law board and the banks would go to the debt recovery tribunal. And like I showed you in the screen, there were seven acts that could be used to solve specific problems in the company. So while the civil court would handle claims like unpaid salaries or contracts, the debt recovery tribunal will only focus on loan recovery. And lastly, the company law board will work on resolving the disputes related to the rights of the shareholders. So all three entities work individually in different angles, but somehow nobody would focus on the root cause of the problem, which is the financial distress of the company. So just like the building collapsed, the company would collapse and shut down. The employees would lose their jobs, creditors would lose their money and the shareholders will see their share value collapse to the ground. So nobody gets anything good out of this issue. In fact, in the real world, the problem was so complicated that in most cases, the employees and banks would just let the company fail and still not complain at all. Why? Because if an employee went to the court, the case remained pending for several years. If the banks registered a complaint, then they were asked to show their bad loans record which was again dangerous for their shareholders and for their reputation. So it was just too messy and extremely complicated. This is the reason why hundreds of companies in India faced a terrible end to their story, thousands of people lost their jobs, shareholders witnessed millions of dollars in losses and most importantly, the creditors lost billions of dollars in this process. And because of this and several other problems in our banking sector, we were at the brink of a banking crisis in 2018. Banks didn't have enough power to get promoters to pay or to put the stressed assets back on track. They didn't have the right kinds of tools. Too much lending to the bad projects that need to be shut down and too little lending to viable projects that need to be supported. And this problem was so, so critical that it used to take us 4.3 years on an average to resolve an insolvency. And if you look at our recovery rate, it was just 26 cents on the dollar. So if 1 lakh crores got stuck in these companies, we were only able to recover 26% or just 26,000 crores and 74,000 crores would just go down the drain. This is the reason why in 2016, the NDA government introduced something called the IBC or Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. And this was such a revolutionary concept that after 2016, we had done such an incredible job that our recovery rate by 2021 had shot up to 71.6 cents on the dollar. So in 2021, if 1 lakh crore got stuck, we were recovering 71,600 crores. So you see, that is a 45,600 crores jump per 1 lakh crores in value. 
So the question over here is, what is so revolutionary about this Indian bankruptcy code and how did it cause such a drastic difference in our recovery? Well, the answer to this lies in this framework of IPC. So let's understand each step in simple words and then you will understand the gist of the matter. The first step is initiation. This initiation can be done by both operational creditors like company employees or vendors and by financial creditors like banks or NBFCs. In fact, anyone whom the company owes 1 crore rupees can initiate the insolvency process in the NCLT or the National Company Law Tribunal. So in our housing society context, it's like any committee or any resident can raise a red flag about the safety of the building to the central authority instead of the garden committee or the maintenance committee. Then comes step number two. In this process, just like the central authority of the housing society goes out there and examines the intensity of the problem and then decides to take action, in IBC, the NCLT examines if all the criteria are met to initiate the process of insolvency. And then the process of insolvency starts. Now, once this process starts, the company is put under something called the moratorium period. That means no legal action can be taken against the company during this period. So creditors cannot informally take any decision to recover their money during this moratorium period. In the context of the housing society, it's like the central board saying that no other committee or resident will take any action till the next 180 days. Otherwise, just like the garden committee suddenly started diverting the water supply that made the building weaker, here the creditors might start selling the assets of the company to recover their money and that might deteriorate the value of the company. Then during the same time in step number four, there is a professional person called the interim resolution professional who is appointed. This person is appointed by the NCLT and he will be responsible for the entire process of resolution. It's almost like a plumber coming into the housing society who can single handedly manage the entire chaos. Now mind you, this person is an interim resolution professional as in this post is temporary. And during this entire time, the control of the existing management is suspended. Then in step number five, this IRP or interim resolution professional, he will ask all the banks to show proof as to how much does every bank have to recover, how much money is pending and so on and so forth. Similarly, he will also go on to ask the vendors to tell him how much money is pending from the company. And then based on this, the IRP forms a committee of creditors. Then these creditors appoint a resolution professional. So this guy will handle the rest of the procedure. So both the committee of creditors and the resolution professional, they will keep the business operations running and now the control of the company will no longer remain with the promoter. So these people will make sure that they pay all the vendors, they will pay the salaries to the employees and they will keep the operations of the company running. So unlike before 2016, where the entire company is practically paralyzed, here the company is kept running so that the revenue is still being generated in the company. And this is why ladies and gentlemen, the game actually changes. Because if you keep the company running instead of shutting them down with cases, something magical happens. When the company is running, there are two options of handling this situation. The first option is the CIRP process or Corporate Insolvency Resolution Process whereby the resolution professional could find a buyer, sell the company off and then recover their debt. So the creditors of Thinkfisher could simply sell Thinkfisher to Indigo or Air India and then recover their debt. And when this buyer comes in, the parties might actually come together for something called debt restructuring. And this is done so that the company could become a sensible value proposition for the buyer. So if Thinkfisher gets caught up with a debt of 500 crores at a 12% interest to be paid in 10 years, then the creditors might come together and restructure the debt in such a way that they would decrease the interest to 6% and extend the tenure to 20 years. So this way, in the first case, while the company had to pay 71 lakhs per month in installment, after the restructuring, they just have to pay 35 lakhs in installment. So this way, instead of losing the entire 500 crores, the creditors can take a haircut on their profit margin. And then after the company becomes financially lucrative, it can be sold and taken over by the new management. But if there are no buyers at all, they can simply liquidate the company, sell the company's assets and then use the money to pay off their debts. And this is done after 180 days of the resolution process and could be stretched at max to 270 days. That's it. So in simple words, if Thinkfisher has three aircrafts worth 100 crores and an office worth 30 crores, then they can sell these assets to other companies and then recover 330 crores right away and take an exit. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but then in all these cases, the company is functioning, the employees are paid, the vendors are retained and the creditors get their money. Otherwise, in the first case, if the company simply shuts down due to pending bills and court cases, then nobody gets anything. This is how the process of liquidation or sale is carried out in such a way that all the stakeholders get an exit. 
Now some people who here might say bro all this is theory na can you show me a real world example as to how this IBC was implemented and thousands of crores were saved Well for those people here's a classic story back in 2017 there was a company called Bhushan Steel and this company was suffering due to high debt operational inefficiencies and bad market conditions in total if you see this graph their total debt shot up from 15000 crores in 2011 to 55000 crores and just the overdue principal and interest stood at 8000 crores so this was an alarming situation but you know what in 2017 the rbi clearly identified 12 large accounts that were in default asked the lenders to file an application for corporate insolvency the creditors submitted total claims amounting to 62000 crores then the irp accepted claims worth 57505 crores and eventually since they kept the company running tata steel came in bid for bushin steel and tata steel acquired 72.65% stake for a total of 35200 crores which was around 5 billion dollars So in total the creditors recovered 68% of their money because instead of shutting down Bushin Steel was kept running until the Tata's could acquire it. So in just one year Tata officially acquired Bushin Steel through the insolvency resolution process. This is how the overall bankruptcy process in India after IBC increased our rate of recovery from 26.5% to 71.6% in 2021 and the time taken for resolving this insolvency reduced significantly from 4.3 years all the way down to 1.6 years till 2021. And this revolutionary process ladies and gentlemen brought in four incredible superpowers for India. Firstly it improved India's ease of doing business. So now more investors are interested in investing in India because they know that even if the company does not perform the insolvency can save their money from burning. The second superpower for the economy is cheap debt. So before IBC companies had to pay high interest on loans because the lenders were worried that they wouldn't get their money back if the company went bankrupt. But now the lenders are more confident because they'll be able to recover their money if something goes wrong using the IBC procedure. And last and most importantly, these thousands of crores that the banks were losing, it was not just the bank's money, it was your money and my money which were deposited with the banks. So if a bank goes down, our deposits will go down with the bank. So in this context IBC acted as a savior for thousands of crores of depositors money without even we knowing about it. This is how the Indian bankruptcy code has drastically changed the way Indian businesses fail and eventually saved jobs, money and the economy of India. But you know what guys today in 2024 IBC is facing three major challenges and if you're in the legal system or if you're an entrepreneur this is something that you can work on i don't know how but have a look at the challenges you see even though the number of days for the entire process is expected to be less than 330 days this number has now shot up to 653 days as of 2023 now even though this number is a drastic improvement from 1570 days in 2017 the legal committee or the entrepreneurs need to look into this matter so that we can decrease the time of this process from 653 days to again less than 200 days because our competition is not the old version of india our competition is at the international level with some of the biggest countries with some of the most advanced legal procedures in the world so if you're an entrepreneur look into this system and see where we can increase the efficiency secondly we have very less judges and less experienced judges to handle these complex insol in the cases in india and this gives rise to the third problem whereby the average recovery rate has gone down to 32% on an average and this is majorly because we have less judges to process these cases which again points towards a very big legal bottleneck in india this is a story of ibc the problems it solved the solutions it brought and the challenges that it is facing in 2024 and i just hope you learned something very very valuable That's all from my side for today guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button and not to make YouTube our happy. And for more such insightful business, political and economic case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one.